Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is game six from the 2021 FIDE World Chess Championship match between Magnus Carlsen playing on the white end and Jan Nepomnici. Going into game six for level, two and a half points apiece in this race to seven and a half. There's a lot to this game. Players were in bullet mode to meet first time control, blitz mode to make second time control. You can check out the clocks to get a feel for where the action, you know, how down to the wire it was uh, in this game. We set a record in this game for longest game in World Chess Championship history, move-wise, breaking a 124-move game that ended in stalemate in Game 5 of the 1978 title match between Karpov and Korchnoi. Many imbalances in this one, and at the end of the day, it lasted about 7 hours and 45 minutes. There's a lot to unpack. Let's hop in. D4 by Carlson. We had D4 by Carlson in game 2, which was a Catalan opening. Not quite a Catalan in this one, though. It's considered a pseudo-Catalan. After both sides castle, if White wants to arrive at a Catalan opening, if he wants to get to... Uh, a position from game two, he can play c4. In this game, instead, it's b3. Prepares to Fianchetto and prepares to have a pawn there to recapture on c4. Black strikes the white center, and white immediately resolves the tension. Uh, the idea behind this is to take advantage of the unprotected bishop on c5. So once c4 is in, d takes c, queen c2, can't take on b3, lose the bishop. So black defends that. White can pick this pawn up on c4 right now, but instead uh, welcomes gambit play. So knight b to d2, white would prefer to take on c4 with the knight and key in on the e5 square, maybe even have in mind knight a5. A knight on a5 can coordinate really well with the bishop on g2. Okay, black doesn't pursue this pawn plus. He doesn't take on b3. Uh, if black captured on b3, the knight can recapture. Bishop b6 is met with the pawn advance. Keeps in mind, uh, well, it also sets up a skewer. And if the bishop falls back here, an idea would be knight b, excuse me, knight f to d2. Opening up the bishop's eyes, it's a bit awkward for black to complete queen side development. And this knight is ready to uh, hit the bishop on d6. It's a bit uh, uncomfortable, right? White is down a pawn, but has some nice queenside play, queenside pressure. Instead, Black says, I'm going to get on with development. Knight c6 it is. Pawn is recaptured. And Black plays b5, so very sharp play, direct play. Uh, not just going one step, going two, generating a threat in vacating b7 for the bishop. Now, this is a, one of those proceed with caution type moves. The knight's now hanging. The rook is more accessible. What follows is knight c to e5. Now, if this other knight went here, the way out for black is to play knight d4. Hit the queen, and then follow up with bishop b7. White still has to worry about this, and the bishop is functioning well opposite white's light square bishop. The move played in the game is knight c to e5, ducks this, and it's important now for black to, again, avoid this knight exchange. If black captures on e5, this is a problem for black. The knight is getting into c6, the rook is hit. Big problem for black. In the game... The best move was played, knight to b4. Hits the queen and keeps a watchful eye, at least for the moment, over c6. 
Now, this next move is queen to b2, which on the surface looks a little bit awkward because normally you would want to put that bishop there. But the reason that move is played is because if, let's say, the queen goes to b1, black's able to play bishop b7, and now right around the corner, let's say after white tries to scare away the knight with a3, this bishop can slip into e4 with tempo. It's quite timely. After the queen moves, the knight gets to move forward, and this is uncomfortable for white, having to work around this knight deep in white's house, supported by the bishop. So, in order to avoid this possibility, the queen takes up the post on b2. The bishop b7 follows. The knight's now given a kick, and it must go backwards. c6 it is. The knight exchange is avoided for the moment, hitting the bishop. Bishop b6. Bishop g5. Black gets on with putting a rook on an open file. And white takes on f6 unprovoked. Doesn't wait for h6. Gets on with this capture. And uh, this is where things really start to get interesting. Uh, normally, if you're going to end up with a damaged kingside structure, you'll want to make sure the queens are off the board. But this is... Uh, I'd say ambitious play by black in recapturing with the pawn, keeping the queens aboard. Now this pawn does a good job in controlling the knight. Can't get to any of these squares, but what may be nearby are moves such as knight f4, knight h5. Uh, these are the big holes that are created with this g pawn converted to an f pawn. Okay. Uh, this is considered a balanced position after a queen exchange. Uh, I believe the follow-up computer was suggesting b4 keying in on the c5 square. Around even. King safety, not an issue in that, in that position without the queens. Okay, but in this game, move 17, g takes f6. Rook on a to c1 gets out of any possibilities of a skewer. The bishop recapturing on d4. We do have the knight dive in. The bishop recapturing. The queen has a responsibility. There is pressure there. Many exchanges now. Light square bishop's off. King is exposed. Uh, f3, king g1. Both were considered close to equal. Uh, there are pros and cons with each. In the game, it's king g1. Uh, this allows the black queen to now take up a very strong post in the center on e4. Quite the pest, this queen on e4. Uh, a benefit in playing f3 is you stop queen e4. However, uh, white would be giving up this big square to the bishop on e3, and this can be quite disruptive. So in the end, it's king g1, queen e4, Queen c2 supports the knight. And after a5, we have rook f to d1. King g7, getting off of any checks that may uh, happen on the back rank. Useful move, secures f6. It's a, it's a nice king improvement. And after rook to d2, we have black go for an imbalance. Rook A to C1, and this, this happens. We have the two rooks versus queen in balance. And now black, uh, well, even though white has the two rooks versus the queen, there are these pawns over here that are uh, a bit vulnerable. White goes right after them. B3 is unprotected, so some pressure there. B4 is played. And it's important for black to uh, keep the A pawns around. Plays A4. If black exchanges the pawns, uh, this makes life much easier for white. Because this knight, if we start at E2, E2 defends the knight, the knight defends the pawn. 
and we need only to connect the rooks. It makes white's task much easier if black captures on b4. It's a4 in this game, and black clearly has an eye on the a3 pawn. Once this guy falls, this guy is very, very dangerous, and was a, uh, I think, the main contributor in Carlson ending up in serious, serious time pressure. I believe, as both players were reaching move 40 in this game, they were under a minute, and there isn't an increment. So that's all they had until that bonus time hit at move 40, where they gain an hour at move 40. So very tense game. E3 from here. Bishop E5, H4. Um, I think the primary idea behind this is not to play h5. Uh, I guess this could maybe be an idea. Somehow the rook's circling back here. Maybe this pawn controls a critical square at some stage. But the, the main one that I'm seeing here is that a new square is produced for the king on h2. From here, h5, king, a2, king h2, bishop, bishop to b2. Uh, capture like this, that would drop the rook. Capture with the rook. I would drop the knight. Um, doesn't go for that. Instead, the rook to c5. What's that? Move 32. About 10 minute advantage for Nyapomnichi at this stage. This, this rook is hitting a lot of, uh, excuse me, this rook is hitting a lot of stuff. The queen, the pawns. The queen can't go too far either. Right, this. This bishop on b2 is hit twice. If the pin is no longer there along the d-file, let's see. say the queen goes here, we can, take the, we can take the bishop. So she stays on the d-file. Queen d6, rook d1, bishop takes a3. We have a passer. So now it's two rooks versus a queen and a very dangerous pawn. Rook takes b5, gets a pawn back. Queen d7, rook c5, and only move. Move 35. A lot of pressure on the clock. e4, nearby there's... e5, nearby there's e4. Rook c2. Queen d5. Some coordination, finally, with these rooks. The main... The main idea for white is to go after the a pawn at this stage so queen b3 rook a2 after e4 knight c5 that's move 39 queen takes b5 and now right around here in meeting move 40 have a, have a look at the clocks <laughs> these are rough guys but it, it's it's close to uh, this is right about where we were with the clock times um this is where plenty of mistakes occur in games. And uh, in the game, Carlson took the pawn on e4. This is not considered best. Uh, there is a, a nice idea White could have gone with at this stage. Rook on d to c2. But again, he only had seconds. So this is, this is a ballpark figure. I think he had a little less than a minute remaining as he played this last move. Knight takes e4. Uh, rook c, uh, rook d to c2 is pretty cool. Uh, this bishop is frozen. This pawn can't move. And this queen cannot go too far. She has to stay trained on this bishop. I, I guess maybe this one's an option. You can't take here because of that. But my point here is that the queen is... Uh, pretty restricted. Well, actually, if the queen goes there, we simply pick up the a pawn. So it's difficult for black in this position if, if white found this move. Uh, the follow-up idea, the point behind rook d to c2, let's say f5 is played, the point here would be that white can now get rid of the a pawn. And after this, we can reach a new imbalance. Uh, well, 
a more simplified looking imbalance, no minor pieces, and we have once more two rooks playing against the queen. And this is a super healthy kingside structure. And these guys here will be very vulnerable to the rooks. Form a battery on the fifth rank. And watch over F2. This is the only point to watch over. This is going to be big trouble for black. He didn't find rook D to C2. Instead, knight takes E4. If you take the knight, the rook would take the pawn. And then soon this pawn and play is pretty simple from there. Put the both rooks on the F-file and these guys will all drop off while the rook watches over the only sensitive point F2. Black understood this. He does not bite, does not take that knight on E4. Instead, it's queen B3. And black is prepared to put the pawn on A3. Only now two steps away. How do we get this pawn? White first repositions the pieces, knight on f4, find some secure squares. Eventually, putting the rooks on the a file. This knight was also maybe ready to grab on h5, so some defensive move for black. But how exactly do we get this pawn? We need the knight to reposition and put pressure here. So starts off with knight e2, knight d4. And in this position, the king goes back to h2. If white in this position immediately tries to go for the pawn with knight c2, this isn't the greatest because let, let me let me make a passing move. Let's say the king goes here. If well, I, I'm sorry. Let, let me make this move right here. The move played in the game after after king h2. And no, let me let me get back right here. I will I will get this right. <laughs> after knight to d2, uh, knight to d4. Excuse me, and king to h7. If white tries this move uh black can play bishop here and there's a problem this is the problem knight takes a3 can be met with bishop takes rook and after rook takes bishop i think there's a better move than this one but this one's clearest for me to see the queen on b3 kills this knight. Where does it go? It doesn't have a move other than b1. And the rook doesn't have a move other than watching over the knight. If the knight ever goes to b1, the queen's going to be winning a piece. Still, though, this would not be losing for white. As difficult a position white is in right now, it's not losing. Because, let's say after knight here and queen to b2, white would have a fortress. White can part ways with the knight. And whatever black does next doesn't matter. This rook gets to f4. And I do not believe this position can be broken down by black. This structure is too good. There is only one point to watch over. The rook or king can watch over f2. And how do you dislodge the rook? You can always maybe go to f3, f5. The king could jump around on g1 or g2. Maybe even we have e4 in there. And he could play this. I don't think this is a... Uh, a position that can be broken down. So it's something to bear in mind. This is this is a possible way out for white uh, if he needs to go in this direction. So in the game, it's king h2, queen e4. Black is uh, allowing this pawn to be picked up. He has a threat. With this pawn pinned, the queen's ready to take h4. Uh, he's okay with that. The number one problem for white is this pawn on a3, so he takes that out. And he does this, you know, white, white plays this 
being prepared to enter this particular imbalance where ideally you want that rook again on f4 and uh, I think the idea would be you put the rook on f4, you get this pawn to e4, and you get this knight to e5, excuse me, d5, and then you start hunting these pawns one by one. This would be a very difficult position for black to try and hold. I don't think black can be disruptive enough to stop the rook from eventually getting to the f-file. Maybe, uh, maybe we start, well, no, not, not knight here right away. There can be queen here. Uh, I'm not sure the exact setup, maybe this one, trying to get this and this. That, that, that's looking like a good start. Try to get the, the rook here. And can black even stop that? Uh, I'm not seeing a great way for black to even stop that. So it seems pretty, pretty clean way to get to f4. And then we go from there as white. Okay, tall task ahead for black if they go in this direction. In the game, black picks off the h-pawn. There's a check, king g1. Another imbalance can surface here. After king g1, black played queen e4. If this is tried, the capture on g3, and then this pawn starts to run, Here's a cool variation, e4, queen check, king g1, and I'll just, I'll just show one variation. After queen takes e4, here's how white can follow. White will win the queen with the check. All these squares are covered. The king eventually has to go to f8. Rook g2 check, rook h8 check, and in the end, we have this skewer supported by the knight. So this trick is not working. That's not the only variation, but I cannot, uh, I can't, can't show them all. I have to pick and choose here in this super lengthy game. Okay. In this, in this one, it's queen e4. More repositioning. Queen is hit. The rook is hit. So queen there, rook on a1 to a2 staying coordinated. Uh, white is the one playing for two results, especially now that that A-pawn is gone. Uh, these guys are vulnerable. So how to stay coordinated is the big question for white, while also trying to avoid perpetual checks. Starts with F3. This safeguards the king along the diagonal. At the same time, it makes the king vulnerable along the second rank. This knight, for some time from here, is going to need to simply be a babysitter for the king, shield the king from checks. We see plenty of knight, mo knight maneuvers in this one. Kicks off with f4. This not only uh, kicks the bishop to a square that will be... Uh, well, the bishop will be a bit more vulnerable on any other, any other square besides e5. There isn't a, another square where black would have pawn support. So it's a bit more vulnerable wherever else it goes. Also with f4 in there, f3 is vacant for this guy. And this square is made use of by the knight uh, many times over. It's a, it's a really good piece defending against perpetual checks. So king f2, bishop b3. This, now that f3, f4 is in, e3 is sensitive. So black keeps some pressure there with first the bishop. Now the queen is on that. So some defense is needed with rook e4. And let's get to an interesting point here, getting some maneuvers in. Uh, this rook is in a spot to address this potential battery. This is one of the, I, I think, the main idea behind queen to b4. We don't want this queen getting into e1, right? If we don't do anything, we're in big trouble. Here's a way we could get mated. That would be painful. So it's rook c1, some defense. The rooks are, well, this rook is defended. They're not, the rooks aren't connected, but the, the knight is helping out. 
uh, to defend the rook on c1. So this one isn't tactically vulnerable. This is the only one. From here, rook e5, queen b3, rook back to e1. Now, in this position, there's a way that white can go wrong. A tempting move for white in this position is to say, this pawn is a little bit sensitive. Let me attack it. Big problem for white if he goes for that. The problem here is that black would be able to play f6. And where does this rook go? Has a responsibility. Doesn't have many squares. Here or here are the only ones. But the king can guard both, one way or the other. This rook is kicked from defense of e3 and big trouble for white with e3 collapsing. This is not good. Tempting, but not good. Rook e8 instead. Queen d5. Queen in the corner. Rook back. A little repetition. We do have some back and forth going on in this game. If queen h2, the king can step up. If h4, we can capture. This knight could take up a nice post on g3. White would be winning from this position. Knight is an excellent defender of the king. There are no good checks for the black queen. So the queen gets central. Black is doing a really good job. This is a difficult task. Uh, there are many different configurations white can go with. Black always has to try and find a way to keep pressure on white's position and make it uncomfortable for white to coordinate. And so he's, he's always trying to watch over the e3 pawn. Bishop gets away. We get on the fifth rank. So now we have some pressure on the bishop, the pawns indirectly. Rook on the seventh. And now both rooks, right, with this last move, the queen no longer has defensive b5. So now we're converging on f5. Bishop a7. Rook a5. Rook, uh, well, rook back to b5. Bishop a7. And now rook takes pawn. So with this move, uh, some calculation for sure. After queen d3, notice what's happening here. The queen is in a position putting pressure on both rooks. If either one steps over to e5 to defend, the other one would be overloaded. So for example, this guy here, black could take. And if you recapture like this, there goes that rook. And in this position, if you step over, similarly, we would have this chop and then this one. And it seems to be uh, tending much more towards a drop. Instead, it's rook takes f7, entering a new imbalance, one where it is uh, a rook, knight, and two pawns versus a queen and pawn. Well, a rook, knight, and two pawns versus a queen. These guys offset. These two highlighted pawns will soon be exchanged. So how to... Coordinate your pieces is the big question. For white, we want to make sure we don't end up in, we don't want to allow a perpetual check. Very difficult task ahead for Team Black. A lot of different tries for white. The main one here being to try and get the E pawn rolling. If this pawn could get rolling, you could start to see some progress made by white. So, how to stop pawn to E4? We have a pin. All right, from here, rook c2, knight d4. Some of these checks inserted, I'm not sure they have a great point to them. Maybe they, you know, constantly giving checks like this, black has to make the decision, do I move forward or backward? That's That can sometimes be tricky. Okay, another check thrown in, knight back to its favorite square. There is no queen h2. Knight g5 check, another check, knight on d4, once more, rook in the spot to safeguard the king in this case. And eventually white finds the following setup, one that will help him to advance the e-pawn one step. 
So it's the knight going back home. A lot of fancy knight moves. We're 105 moves in. Knight g1. And now we have the knight getting to e2. And by this point, in fact, right after rook d4, this is where Jan had a little bit of a think. How much time? Maybe about a minute and a half. He knew what was coming for sure at this stage with the rook on d4. He knew the knight is going to shield the king from any checks. Look at this cozy home currently for the king. There's no getting at him. And this knight defends the rook, and this rook defends e4, which means e4 will be coming. And a lot of squares will then be under control, and it gets to be a little bit scary for the black king with this duo that uh, can continue to move next. Once this pawn is on e4, then maybe there's f5 or e5. White has a pick. So the queen sticks around here on this back rank, still with the nigh on h1. The e pawn gets rolling. Some check thrown in. Other checks. The h and g pawns are exchanged, and we're down to this final imbalance. Rook and knight, ver rook, knight and two pawns versus queen. This position right here is a draw. A table based draw. Computer versus computer game. If, if it was a computer versus computer game, the game would be over. Uh, table base draw would be declared. And, well, no, these guys play like computers, but this is a very tall task for black at this point. Uh, a lot of problems still to solve. Nearly an impossible task for black. Great defense up to this point. Let's see what follows. Let's see this next setup. White finds coordination in the following way. The piece is doing a good job in blocking the checks. And the plan here is to recognize that the queen side of the board, there's a lot of room for this queen to maybe give checks. So uh, the king has two, two ways. You know, he could try to circle around like this. Or he could go like this. And if he goes in this direction, uh, the queen is going to be able to give checks somewhere from a distance. But it's not so easy to do similar when the king is on this side of the board. There's not as, not as much space for the queen. The king is uh, better off on the edge in this case. There are no I files j files so it's the h file the king eventually makes use of in this one first the rook getting to an awesome post great coordination once more there's only one unprotected pawn but at any point there can maybe be a check here 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 all of these pawns well these two pawns are controlling or supporting any of these rook moves so this king can be attacked in all sorts of ways. So king e7, check, another check. Now this pawn advances. Nice coordination nearby. A rook on f6, if we get that one in there, everything is defended, and the king can improve along the h-file. From here, king a2, king h3, this position is still considered a draw by the table bases. There are about 20 moves in this position, and only two of them are considered to be a draw. Queen b1, and I believe queen c2. I'm not 100% not on queen c2. I think queen c2, but queen b1. The main idea here being to keep the, the queen on the back rank, to be in a spot to maybe give a check to maybe go to this square and pin the knight if the king is on h4, or if the king is on g3, to go to g1 and pin the knight in that way, to work along the first and second rank. The first rank is, is the main rank to be on here. 
In the game, though, we had queen to e6, and now this is considered a win, table base-wise. And let's see how play continues, reaching move 30. I didn't point it out that once we reached move 125, that's where we broke the record. But this one still continues for a handful more moves. Uh, we do, in this game, end up getting to 136. The knight, a convenient defender here for the king. It's improved. Nice synergy between the rook and knight at this stage. Uh, the knight is within checking distance, so some tricks are right around the corner. Before, the queen was doing a good job staying at a distance, but now she's really close to the knight, so tricks are nearby. And we see one in action right now after queen h7, e6. Is the rook hanging? Not really. There's a trick. There goes the queen. And this is, of course, a one position. So what's tried is queen to g6. From here, rook f7, another trick. If this pawn is captured in this position, there would follow knight g7. Knight takes queen. We only have a pawn, but white is winning this king and pawn ending. Wherever you go, you get outflanked. Here, once more, you can get outflanked, and this pawn is ready to go. So, after rook f7, we have the king getting out of any knight checks. White presses. Perfect coordination here. It cannot be broken down. After queen g1, we have the final move in this game. Knight g7. And black resigns. What do you do here? If we start giving checks on the h file and g file, the king simply zigzags his way all the way to g8. And once he's on g8, there are no good checks. These pieces uh, shield the king from any checks. And note also what the knight on g7 is doing. It's controlling the promotion square. This one's already under control. White is now ready to play e7. And next, e8 with check, no matter what. How might that play out? Let's just see it in action. Not really much you can do. Eventually he gets here. And then here. And what can you even try? This one we're pushing. Double check. Yeah, it's game over. Anything else? Queen here. That's not working. We're winning with this variation. Knight supporting f6. King is supporting f7, f8. Game over in that variation as well. So, 160, excuse me, 136 move games setting a record for the longest uh, game move wise in World Chess Championship history. Exhausting. These guys played an excellent game. It was really tense. Uh, both players under pressure. M most pressure initially by uh, Carlson was initially under the most pressure. Meeting that first time control was really, really tense. If you were there during the live stream, you know it. <laughs> you felt it. I know I felt it. Um, what a game. They had a lot. This was this was not only the first decisive game of this World Chess Championship match, but the first decisive game in a World Chess Championship match in five years. <laughs> We've waited this long for that breakthrough. So Carlson now up three and a half, two and a half in this race to seven and a half. Let's have a look at the tail of the tape. Now, this game was so long, I needed two graphs in order to show you the tail of the tape. So let's get to it right here. This is the graph for the first 100 moves. Uh, the graph only uh, on Lee Chess, it only is able to show the first 100 moves at the moment. So 
here's the assessment of the first 100 moves. And we can have a look at what the average centi pound loss after these first 100 moves. After move 100 by black, queen h1. Average centi pound loss is 10 apiece. And moving on to the remaining 36 moves. There we go. Uh, that's how it that's how it went for the the rest of the game. Right here was the last moment after King H3. I believe I was saying Queen B1 or Queen C2 were the only draws, but basically an impossible task at that point for Team Black, who again put up tremendous resistance in such a tough, tough position. Uh, after Queen E6, it was. Yeah, that was that was the ball game in the computer's eyes. Table base uh, draw was no longer there. So those final 36 moves, average centi pawn loss for Carlson 11 and 41 for Nepomnici. So what a game. Uh, we continue. Um, I need to rest up. That was a very long game, 7 hours, 45 minutes. It took for these guys to complete the game, so... Look forward to game seven. As usual, feel free to leave any feedback to this video in the comment section below. Hope you enjoyed it and maybe took a thing or two or three away from this uh, historical game. That's all for now. Take care. Bye.